Well, I see the participants are, are trickling in. I have a lot to cover this hour. Uh, so I'm going to get started. Um, welcome to uh, Working with Asynchrony Generically Part 2. I'm talking about um, the executor's proposal that's um, on track for C++23. Um, so this is, uh, like I said, part two of uh, a two-part talk. Um, hopefully you are here for part one. Otherwise, this isn't going to make a tremendous amount of sense to you. Um, so uh, if you are watching this online on YouTube um, after the fact uh, and you haven't watched uh, the part one video, I, I recommend going back and, and watching that one first. Um, so the summary from part one is, you know, for, I talked about the vision that we're, we're trying to build an asynchronous analog of... Um, Alexander Stepanov's STL. We went through some very simple examples and, and uh, introduced uh, the sender concept. We talked about the life cycle of an asynchronous operation using sender receiver, what actually happens um, when you uh, start an asynchronous operation. Then we went under the hood of a composite concurrent operation and showed how all the pieces hang together um, and how they compose. And we implemented a very simple algorithm, the then algorithm, um, just to make sure we understand like, you know, how all the pieces fit together. Uh, and we also, also talked about um, uh, how senders um, interact with uh, the C++20 coroutines language feature. This part, I'm going to be talking uh, generally about structured concurrency and then in particular um, structured concurrency um, in relation to sender and receiver. Uh, can we talk about cancellation support because um, cancellation support is very important in structured concurrency. And then we'll work through an extended, an exa extended example. So a lot of code. Hopefully not too much. Okay. So first, structured concurrency. Uh, probably best understood um, by first looking at unstructured um, code. Back in the um, prehistory of computer programming, um, this is what a uh, computer program looked like. Um, you used uh, jumps uh, for control flow. Um, there were no higher level constructs. Uh, and people would uh, annotate their code using arrows like this um, to help them visualize the control flow. Um, and, and this might remind you a little bit of something. Um, this is where the term spaghetti code comes from. Uh, I have taken this from um, this wonderful blog post here, uh, a go-to statement considered harmful by Nathaniel Smith. And I communicated with him about this, um, uh, and I got his permission to... Um, uh, to use some of his, his diagrams from that blog post um, because I thought they were so uh, evocative. Um, so I highly recommend uh, adding this particular uh, blog post to your uh, reading queue. Um, so you can see the link here. I, I, I will upload these, these uh, slides. You could access this all later and then I'll go check that, that blog post out. It's, it's, it's real mind-blowing mind stuff. Okay, so we don't want spaghetti code. We want structured code. So structured programming came along and replaced um, uh, the sort of jump style uh, programming, go to. Um, famously, um, Edgar Dijkstra wrote um, that uh, article um, way back called uh, uh, Go To Considered Harmful. Um, and when she was talking about exactly this, um, how structured control flow constructs, um, you can treat them like a, back, a black box um, because they have one uh, uh, entry point, one exit point. Um, and and uh, you know, if you were to replace it with a black box, then it just looks like linear control flow. And that's true of conditionals, loops, and function calls as well. Okay. In contrast, uh, go to is unstructured because it doesn't fall in this this linear sequence of of of, um, uh, of execution. Uh, it jumps off into hyperspace. Right? And Dijkstra's point was um, 
the 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 property uh, that these things you can treat them like back boxes um, that makes them very easily composable. Right? I can put a conditional in a loop in a function call, not a problem. But if I write my code with go to, my code doesn't compose anymore. So we don't like go to, we like code that can compose. So if you were here in the last hour, there was a question about um, uh, folly executors. Um, and uh, uh, I, I explained that it was a lot like uh, uh, ASIO executors uh, or the networking TS executors, where you have this thing called an executor and it has a function called execute and it just takes a function and it executes that function uh, on that execution context and it returns void. So that work is now like um, somewhere off in some other execution context running. This is how I might draw the control flow of the execute algorithm. Uh, you know, we we have uh, this execution um, uh, thread of execution here that continues past the execute, and then we have this other thread of execution that kind of forks off and and goes running uh, on some other execution context, and, and never rejoins um, this main line. At least not as part of that construct, right? So fire and forget work is a lot like go to. It has all the same properties and all the same problems. Uh, in particular, um, if this function, compute async, and this function, compute helper async, need to share code, need to share data, I mean, then that data either needs to be uh, global or thread local or, or, or ref counted in some way. Um, you have to do like manual memory management in, in order to, to keep data alive because these two operations don't have lifetimes that that nest neatly within each other. Okay. In contrast, we could look at a, a coroutine, right? If this uh, were a coroutine, you would co-await the result of your compute helper. And now we're back to a black box kind of programming model uh, because awaiting a coroutine has a single entry and a single exit. This composes very nicely. You'll notice that the activation of a call e coroutine, and by activation here, I mean like, you know, the, 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 the runtime, the, ex the runtime execution of that coroutine uh, is wholly nested within the activation of the call or coroutine. Right. This is the structure, the structure that coroutines give you. So activations nest, scopes nest, you'll notice. Lifetimes of locals also nest. Right, so you have constructors and destructors that execute exactly as they would in synchronous code. And RAII works as a result, right? I can have a local variable here that has some action in its destructor that does some cleanup work. And, and that'll work just like we, we always expect RAII to work uh, in synchronous code. Right. So this is a very important property uh, of structured code. Now, because of these nested scopes and nested lifetimes and nested activations, it's perfectly safe to pass a local variable by reference. Like here's data. I pass it by reference into another asynchronous function. I know it's going to be done using that asynchronous, that data um, before, it, um, before I exit, before the compute async function has to return because of the, na the structured nature of, of the call. And I don't have to dynamically allocate data. I don't have to reference count it uh, or, or put it in a global or a thread local or anything like that. Just pass a reference. I should point out that only works if you are immediately co-awaiting um, the, uh, the return task. Oh, you can imagine that if, um, if, if this compute async function were to simply return this task um, without co-awaiting it, well, then then you're um, then you end up back with a dangling reference. But of course, it's always easy to, uh, in C plus plus to create dangling references. If you were here for the last hour, you saw the when out, when all example that nested three uh, then expressions, which nested a, a schedule expression. These things are all senders. And when you connect it with a receiver, what you get back is, is this blob. 
and that's um, the operation state, the state of that asynchronous operation, by which I mean like all of the data that needs to be persisted um, for the duration of that, um, of that operation, and also some logic about how to execute it. Okay. Send and receiver is also structured concurrency, right? Activations nest. This is how it executes, outside in, right? So we can see that the activations nest, scopes nest, lifetime of locals nest, and RAII works in sender receiver because of these nested activations. Let's look a little bit at how this um, executes in time. If, if, if you recall, the, the schedule function uh, in this example uh, was scheduling work on a thread pool. So we have when all that executes on, on one thread. And we're going to have all of these other operations um, that we want to execute on another thread. So here's a little bit like what this looks like at the start. When all launches three instances of the then operation. And the then operation launches three instances of the schedule operation. And then at some point, some thread in your thread pool is going to be picking up some work and executing it. Whoops. So that's what happens here at this point in time. And now imagine what happens if uh, one of our set error, one of our, um, our then uh, asynchronous operations completes with an error by calling set error. Well, the semantics of the when, when all algorithm are if any of its uh, child operations complete with an error, the whole when all expression completes with an error. So you can say, well, well, great. I, I already know how this when all is going to complete. I just complete it right now and pass the error on to my caller. And I, I'm done with my work, uh, lickety split. However, you still have all of this other uh, work that is in flight. And these tasks are going to continue executing in the background. This is what we call detached computation, right? This work never joins. And if the work never joins, then it's detached. And you wonder, you know, like what, what happens if, if any of these operations are referencing data that's in the parent, in when all? Well, that, that reference is now going to dangle. It's uh, as if, you know, in synchronous code, think about, try to think about this. It's, it might actually be difficult for you to think about it because it's so broken. But if it were possible somehow for this compute function to return before the compute helper returned, you'd say, obviously, that's nonsense. Um, that would break everything. Of course it does, right? Then this data, um, this reference to this data object would be a dangling reference. Uh, it would be pointing into um, uh, a memory allocation that, that isn't, um, isn't used anymore. So, so we, we intuitively know that this is a bad pattern, that we don't ever want to do this in synchronous code. Now, I want it to be as obvious to you after this talk that you shouldn't do that in asynchronous code either. Okay. So let's look at a different possibility. Maybe, maybe we save the error and report it at the end after we have joined all of the work. So that might look like this. Well, we wait and we wait and we wait. And then we call set error at the very end after all of our other work has finished. Well, then we have the right semantics, but obviously this is taking way too long and we're doing more work than necessary. So the answer in sender receiver is um, to support cancellation. So set error notifies when all immediately that an error has occurred. When all notifies the other running operations uh, that um, they, their, uh, their work, their results are no longer needed, let's say. And so that gives those, oper those uh, asynchronous operations a chance to complete early. 
by calling set done um, uh, calling set done uh, on their receivers, uh, which notifies the um, uh, the when all operation that everybody's work has finished and it's now okay to deliver the error uh, to the um, uh, downstream operation. Right. And that um, saves a ton of time, hopefully, if those tasks are, are responsive to requests to stop. Which brings me to this point, right? In structured concurrency, deep support for cooperative cancellation is essential for good performance. So how does this work in sender receiver? Well, in C++20, we got, we got some interesting and very useful functionality um, that perhaps most people here don't know about. It's called stop token. It came with the JThread proposal. Um, so stop token, um, uh, the cancellation support in, in C++20 is built on top of stop token. And, and here's how uh, cancellation works in, in the stop token model. You have the calling code, that's the um, initiator of the asynchronous operation, and it declares a stop source. And it gets uh, a token from that by calling get token on the stop source. And when it launches that asynchronous operation, it passes the token in. Now, when the calling code uh, has decided that it doesn't need that asynchronous computation anymore and it would like it to stop, it calls request stop on the stop source. And the stop source and the stop token are um, two ends of a communication channel. Uh, so when you call request stop on the stop source, the stop token is aware of that. And so the asynchronous code can either periodically pull that token to see whether or not stop has been requested, and if so, stop early. Or uh, that asynchronous code, when it receives the token, can register a callback with that token. It says, you know, if, if a request to stop ever comes in, execute this function, please, and interrupt me. Okay. So in sender receiver, it looks a little like this. So some senders, like maybe the when all sender, would have a stop source. It connects to a receiver, creates an operation state. It passes a stop token uh, to the operation. Now, you're going to start the work and say somebody says, uh, hey, I don't need this result anymore. Please stop early. And the operation says, I'll do my best. Uh, and so the operation hopefully completes early and notifies the receiver uh, by calling set done on it. I've stopped early. I don't have a value or an error. I've canceled. So this is kind of like um, uh, a three-way handshake. Right? All of these cancellation details are, are internal to algorithms. You notice it's the, it's the when all sender which is uh, the implementation of the win-all algorithm that declares the stop source and is uh, in charge of, of managing the um, propagation of the uh, cancellation signal, the request. So it's a three-way handshake here. You've got the caller that tells the operation to please stop. You've got the operation state that receives that request and then stops and then lets the receiver know that it has stopped. So if we look back at what, um, what was happening when uh, we were executing this composed operation. So we have a receiver, connect, creates uh, uh, a wrapped a receiver, wraps that receiver in another receiver. That receiver is what's holding the stop token, okay? When all, when it creates that receiver, calls get token from its stop source and passes that to the receiver. So in this way, um, the uh, information about that, um, that, that cancellation um, request, uh, that channel uh, is created so that the outer operations can communicate to the inner operations of request to stop early. You could say that the when all defines a cancellation scope and that when you uh, ask that expression 
um, that operation to stop, it'll stop all of its children. Okay. And there's a larger point here, which is like, there's lots of cases where you, uh, an outer operation would want to pass information to inner operations, maybe um, schedulers or allocators or, or, or other information. Uh, in general, that's done by um, uh, augmenting uh, the state of, of the receiver that gets passed into the child operation. Okay. So here's the, the larger point that I want to make about sender, receiver, and cancellation. Right? Orchestrating cancellation is the job of the algorithms, not the user. Algorithms that introduce concurrency need to handle cancellation. Cancellation is asynchronous. It could come in uh, at any point um, from another thread of execution. And it has to be cooperative. There's no way to just like ax uh, uh, a running task. You have to ask it to stop and it has to um, uh, honor that request. It doesn't have to honor that request, I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, it can choose to ignore it, uh, not handle it, um, but it's best to honor that request. So cancellation is best effort. So there's no guarantee that an operation will stop promptly or at all. And we have dedicated algorithms uh, that capture common cancellation patterns. Like for instance, stop when uh, is a particularly useful asynchronous algorithm. So stop when um, takes two senders. One is the, um, the task to run. And the other sender is some condition. And that's going to be the condition when that condition uh, operation completes. Uh, then the stop when algorithm is going to issue a stop request to uh, its running task. OK. So this particular code, we're doing this is our task. We are in a loop repeating some pro uh, process input task. <clears throat> and I can interrupt that loop um, uh, with this. This is going to be a sender, and user interrupt returns a sender. Uh, that sender completes when the user has issued an interrupt. And so this whole expression uh, implements a loop until the user interrupts. <clears throat> All right, now we get um, to jump into our extended example. Um, and this is the part that I'm um, excited to present <clears throat> because it deals with um, uh, all of my favorite things, uh, senders, uh, coroutines, and ranges. Okay, uh, first I have to tell you a very sad story. Um, this is uh, the IBM Model M keyboard. Uh, this shipped with all IBM PCs in the, in the 80s. <clears throat> Probably the greatest keyboard ever made. Um, uh, the thing weighed a ton. It was an absolute beast. Um, and it just has the most wonderful feel. I'm, I'm, I'm outing myself as a keyboard nerd now. <clears throat> Mechanical keyboard nerd, the worst kind. Uh, I loved this keyboard. This is the keyboard I learned to type on. Um, and, and if you've ever, uh, if you grew up in the 80s, uh, you're probably uh, familiar with the sound that it makes. For those of you who didn't grow up in the 80s, I hope that came through. Hopefully you've just heard um, the sound of an IBM Model M. Okay. Uh, I took this keyboard with me to, uh, to my job at Facebook. And uh, here is a picture of it at work, along with a newer keyboard model that I uh, also like um, to type on. But here's the Model M, and you can see all of the different adapters that I needed in order to get it to talk to modern hardware, because this this plug here, this big fat plug, was called an AT, AT plug, an AT port. And so I needed to uh, convert that to a PS2, and then I needed to convert PS2 to USB. Uh, and these days, I'd, I'd have to convert this to a USB-C uh, in order to get it to talk to my, my MacBook. Um, I'm not on a MacBook right now, though. I'm, I'm on a, on a, a, a lap, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a PC. Um, so the, um, the sad part of this story is that, you know, the pandemic hit <clears throat> and uh, foolishly, I left this uh, keyboard at my desk. Um, many, many months later, I quit Facebook 
never having gotten a chance to retrieve that keyboard. Uh, and uh, it seems to have vanished into the ether. Um, I have somebody uh, working on, on tracking it down for me, but I, I, I don't hold out much hope. So this is the, the self-same keyboard that uh, came with the, the IBM PC that my father bought in 1986. And, and it had been with me since 1986, uh, and uh, now it's gone. And so this is a sad story. So my mission uh, in this uh, example is to write a program that monitors the entire system <clears throat> for keyboard events and plays model, model M clicky sounds um, so that I can listen to my Model M um, while I type, regardless of what keyboard I'm actually typing on. Uh, and, and when I uh, shared this idea with my wife, she was like, awesome, then you can listen to your keyboard on your headphones and the rest of us don't have to hear it. <laughs> okay, so here's the, uh, here's the strategy. We're going to first model a key click as a sender. Then we're going to model keyboard input as a range of senders. It's an asynchronous sequence. <clears throat> we'll model an interrupt, uh, say control C, as a sender. We're going to asynchronously transform the range of senders into clicky noises until the interrupt sender completes. And then profit. Step one, model the key click as a sender. Let's assume that there's some system API for registering a keyboard callback. Most systems have an API like this. And I'm going to write a keyboard sender in an op state such that the sender's connect returns the op state, wrapping the user's receiver, and the op state's start places a callback that completes the receiver in a global. Now, you're going to say globals suck, and you're right. Shared statics also suck, um, but many times low-level system APIs force our hand. Um, it's the case with this Win32 API, um, as we'll see. Uh, really, they, they, just, they just accept a, a, a raw C function as a callback. Uh, they don't give you a way to pass any auxiliary data along with it. Um, so really, there's nothing you can do from these system APIs but um, access uh, uh, some global or a shared state. So uh, when you're designing your asynchronous APIs, please don't design APIs like this, <clears throat> because I find it really distasteful to deal with globals. Okay. And then modeling a key click as a sender, the last step is going to be registering a keyboard callback that reads the completion info out of the global and completes it if it's not null. Okay. So let's look at the code. Here is uh, a pending completion. Right, this is going to be a type erased receiver that's waiting for a key click. It's got this um, virtual function called complete that accepts a character. That's the character that was typed. And here's our global registration of the next completion. It's just an atomic pointer. And here is our callback. This is what we're going to give that system API. I call this function whenever uh, a key is clicked. Um, so what it's going to do is it's going to um, replace the, uh, the pending completion with, with null and, and read out what was there previously. And if that was not null, complete it. That's it. Okay. Now here's the sender. Sender has a connect function and, and all it, uh, the connect function is expecting to be passed a receiver um, that accepts characters. Okay, that's what this syntax means. And it just returns uh, a key click operation, which wraps that uh, receiver. And that's all. Uh, we have a read key click function that just returns one of these key click senders. It's an asynchronous API, so it returns a sender this unit of lazy asynchronous work. Um, and so now the, uh, the operation, and this is where the interesting stuff happens. <clears throat> it implements this uh, pending completion interface. It stores the receiver. 
And then it implements uh, the complete function. It checks to see whether the character is control C, and, and if it is, it calls set done. Otherwise, it calls set value, uh, passing that character to the receiver. Now, it's kind of distasteful that we're uh, hard coding our, um, our stop condition uh, here within uh, this particular operation. We would love to be able to externalize our, our stop condition so we could use algorithms to stop the things. Uh, and, and we'll get to that point uh, a little later on. But for now, we're hard coding our stop condition. I stop when someone presses Control C. And then start. Start is uh, used for enqueuing operations. So the way to enqueue this particular operation is to write it into that global. Okay, that's it. <clears throat> So this is our operation state. And uh, we could have also, there was a fair bit of boilerplate in creating you know, the sender and the operation state and everything. Um, so the lib, uh, lib unifex library comes with uh, a helper <coughs> for creating simple senders. Um, it's called create simple. And I should point out this, this is not yet uh, on the main branch of libunifex, um, PR forthcoming. <clears throat> so let me explain what this is doing here. Create simple returns a sender. That sender defines its own operation state. Uh, operation state um, implements start. And what start does for this uh, sender's operation state is it just calls this lambda, which I have passed to the create simple function. So this lambda is going to execute when start is called, when that work is being asked to enqueue itself. Okay. And then this is this lambda is going to return some state. Uh, the operation state is going to persist that state as like an optional or something. And so here's what this key, you know, I, I haven't yet showed you what key click state looks like, but it's going to look somewhat familiar. It's going to look like um, our, uh, our, our previous operation state. It's going to implement pending receiver. It's going to store a reference to the receiver now. The reference that it, it has received from this uh, Lambda when it was created. And now the constructor of this state is what's actually going to do the enqueuing. Now, if you remember, this lambda is called from start. So this constructor is going to be uh, running from start. And start is where we want to enqueue the operation, so that's why this happens here in the constructor. Okay, it, it implements complete function just like it always did. And this object is uh, immovable. I, I delete the move constructor. You think, well, well that's, that's nutty because I'm, I'm returning one right here. Doesn't that invoke a move constructor? It does not. As of C++17, um, we have guaranteed copy elision. Uh, so you don't even have to have a move constructor on returned objects. Um, so what happens is, is this thing gets uh, blasted into place within the operation state and its address is stable. So this is another way that we could have defined the, um, the key click sender. Okay, now here is our, our system API for registering uh, a keyboard callback. Um, uh, let's, let's pretend for a minute um, that, that standard C++ uh, let us uh, express stuff like this. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's, that's not actually the case. But anyway, the, the keyboard callback is this really simple, oops, very simple function. It takes a, a, a raw C function pointer, a callback that accepts a character, and it fires up a thread, and it uses C++20's J thread. This is a self-joining thread. And J thread supports um, stop tokens. So J thread actually has a stop source. It gets a token from it and passes it into uh, the Lambda 
that you are using to launch this thread. And then uh, you execute a loop until stop has been requested. You get a character. Um, this is a blocking call. Um, and this is provided uh, by the Microsoft um, uh, 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 C++ runtime. It's totally not portable. Uh, interestingly, and I learned this um, uh, for, for this talk, uh, standard C++ has, has no way for you to uh, synchronously block for uh, a single uh, keystroke from uh, standard in. Can't do it. There's no way to do it in standard C++. So once you've read that character, uh, you invoke the callback, you pass it to character, check to see if the character is control C and if so, break. Okay. So that's our, our keyboard callback uh, registration function. With all of this, you know, we can, we can register our keyboard callback using our on key click function. If you recall, uh, on key click was the thing that um, pulled uh, the pending completion off the global and completed it. And I can call read key click, which returns my sender, and I can chain work onto it. Um, in this case, just a printf. Here's the character that I got. And then I can sync wait on that whole thing. And I have uh, code. By the way, I had to implement jthread because the Microsoft standard library doesn't offer it yet. Um, but you can see here, it, it has a thread and a stop source. Yep. Okay. And so this is the code that I've just shown you. Here's our keyboard registration. Uh, here's our pending completion. Um, here's our, our callback for, for key clicks. There's our operation state with our start function that enqueues the work. Um, and then read key click it returns our key click sender. This is how we could have implemented it if we wanted to use the um, create sender utility. And here's our main function, uh, which reads the key click and then executes this callback. So I should be able to, let's see, control F5, execute this code. And let's say I press the letter J, I get letter J. Okay, great, done. Okay, that worked. All right. Uh, okay, but that wasn't the mission. The mission was to write a program that monitors the entire system, and not just this particular executable. Okay, how do we do that? Well, um, Kirk Shu, um, bless him, notified me uh, about this Win32 API um, called Set Windows Hook XA, uh, which I had never heard of before. Um, installs an application defined hook procedure into a hook chain. You would install a hook procedure to monitor the system for certain types of events. These events are associated with either a specific thread or with all threads in the same desktop as the calling thread. Now, I imagine when I read this, my face did something like that. Like, here is Windows giving you a really easy way to write a key logger that monitors your entire system for key presses. Like, who thought this was a good idea? I mean, of course, it's, it's secure. You can only uh, install one of these uh, if you are, I think, an administrator on a machine or whatever. Um, uh, but this is just a bizarre, bizarre system API, I thought. Uh, and, and, you know, I, was, I, I did some archaeology. It's really interesting. Uh, like this, this function comes all the way from 16-bit from, uh, Windows. Um, it was part of the Win16 API. Um, and uh, Raymond Chen, um, this Microsoft uh, guy who produces like uh, blog posts every week and has for the past like 20 years, it's insane. He wrote about this um, this function, and you know he says it it came from 16-bit um, Windows. And at the very end of his blog post about um, uh, Windows hooks, 
So next time we'll look at one way people abuse this simple system. No kidding. Wow, what an API. Okay, step two. Model keyboard input is a range of senders. In C++20, this is actually very simple. I have this function called key clicks. It's going to return a range of senders. I call uh, views iota, which creates an infinite range of integers. I pipe that to views transform, um, which throws the integers away and returns um, key click senders. And that's it. I got my infinite range of key clicks. Um, And now with that function, I can write a coroutine called echo key clicks that does a range based for over all of my key clicks and co-awaits each one and getting uh, the character from that key click. And so this is going to execute in a loop and it's going to print out the characters. And the thing to note is that this is um, uh, uh, this function is um, reactive in the sense that uh, it uh, only does work uh, when when new data shows up. Okay. Now we're not used to programming in this sort of um, push-based model. We're we're used to operating more in a in a pull-based model. So this is a, a very interesting um, and natural way of structuring um, your reactive code, code that does stuff um, asynchronously when when some situation, some condition is met. Okay, and now I can register my keyboard callback like before, and I can sync wait on that coroutine to echo all of my um, keystrokes. Oh, one thing I neglected to mention, I'm, I, I introduced this this system API um, for for um, registering um, uh, system-wide uh, uh, hooks. Um, uh, actually, using that system API is just a bunch of like platform-specific uh, gobbledygook um, that I don't think is particularly interesting for the purposes of this talk. So I'm not going into all the details of like you know the Win32 API and, and implementing Windows hooks and, and what that actually looks like. We're going to run with this example. Um, uh, which does uh, just the um, uh, application-specific callback. Uh, and um, everything I say about like registering an application-specific callback uh, uh, pertains to registering a callback with the um, set Windows hook API. Okay. So now I can um, sync wait on, on this coroutine and echo all of my key clicks. Okay. Again, if, if you are really sharp, uh, you may uh, have picked up on something um, about cancellation. So if this key click sender completes with cancellation, which it can because if I get control C, it, it completes with set done, a cancellation request. That's how the sender completes, it calls set done. And in a code routine, if an awaited sender completes with set done, the result is an uncatchable exception. Now, fortunately, sync wait handles this exception and returns an empty option. So this program actually um, behaves exactly how we want it to, but that's kind of accidental. Um, and it's probably not a very nice thing to do to let this cancellation exception propagate out of echo key clicks. Right. If your if your caller, if the caller of this function is an entire asynchronous stack of coroutines, uh, then that entire asynchronous stack is going to get blown away. Oops, probably not what you wanted. So we use one of those algorithms that I introduced earlier. Done is optional. So you use you use that to wrap. Um, your key click sender, and that way you intercept this, this done exception um, and it gets translated into a null opt. So now I can, I can check to find out whether um, this uh, key click uh, was canceled or not by checking to see whether I got an optional that has data in it or not. If it does, I can say, hey, I, I found a character. Otherwise, I can say, 
um, someone interrupted this function and then break out of the loop. Now we can uh, look at that code. Sample two. Let's see. Uh, sample two. And control function five to execute this. And I can uh, type a bunch of characters. Doo -doo 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 -doo, and I can hit control C. And interrupt, and now it breaks out of the loop. Okay. Easy peasy. Now, I was applying done is optional to all of the senders in the range. Well, there's a, um, a, a utility in C20 for doing exactly this transformations of elements of ranges. It's called Fuse transform, we've already seen it. So I could, if I wanted to, use views transform to apply this um, sender adapter to all of the senders in my um, uh, in my range. That would also work. That's that's fine. And the interesting thing to note here is, um, you know, if I have some higher level API that is just expecting a range, an asynchronous range. Uh, then I can use all of these synchronous um, uh, range adapters to uh, layer behaviors on, on um, an underlying uh, sequence of ranges and pass that to the generic algorithm. It's just, just going to treat it like a, a range of centers. Okay, so let's look at this expression again. So this is a synchronous range adapter. That means these uh, transformations are applying to the senders themselves. Well, it's not hard to imagine that you might actually want to apply a range adapter to the results of the senders. So that means there's a whole other category of, of range adapters out there um, that haven't been implemented yet. Asynchronous range adapters. So asynchronous ranges beg asynchronous range adapters. So that's something that will uh, expect to see in the future. And you can think of this, if you are familiar with uh, reactive extensions from other languages, um, this is basically reactive extensions. Okay. Now we're going to model uh, control C as a sender. We have this control C handler. Its implementation is going to look very familiar. It's got a global for appending completion. And it's got the same pending uh, interface. And here's our can console handler. This is uh, a callback that's going to be registered with a Win32 API for intercepting um, control Cs in, in console applications. And what it does is it um, you know, checks to see whether or not uh, the signal is actually a control C. And if so, uh, DQ the pending completion and complete it. It's an RAII thing. It, um, uh, registers the handler in the constructor and unregisters it in the destructor. And now I need to write uh, an asynchronous um, uh, uh, event um, for, for when someone has clicked uh, control C. And so here is um, this uh, event function and it's calling create simple, which is a Unifex, that, that Unifex API I, I, I talked about earlier for returning the sender. So we know um, create simple returns a sender. So so event this function event returns a sender. So it's an asynchronous API, and its operation state is going to call this lambda in its start function. And what that um, lambda is going to do in its start function is it's going to create this state object and return it. So the state object will then then be persisted within um, the operation state. Uh, for this asynchronous operation. And you'll see uh, the constructor here, like previously, um, was what was actually uh, in queuing this, um, this uh, pending completion. And then complete, which was just calling set value on, on its input receiver. Um, like I have completed, now I got a control C.
And I could use this in main um, to sync wait for uh, control C and then print a message like I got control C. And this works. Step four, asynchronously transform a range of senders into clicky noises until the interrupt sender completes. Now, all of this business about, um, you know, uh, making noises, uh, making the computer um, play MP3s and things like that, it's very platform specific and, and not particularly interesting for the point of view of this talk. So I'm not really going to go into the de details. I'll be able to refer you later to the actual code, uh, which is all sitting in the GitHub repo. Um, but we're going to focus on this part until the interrupt sender completes, because this is this is interesting. So we're going to use that stop when algorithm that I talked about earlier to send a stop request when the control C sender completes. And then we should be able to remove the no longer necessary special handling from control C in the key click operation that I mentioned earlier was a bit of a hack. Okay. So if you recall, this, this is where we left our, um, our main function. We're sync waiting on this echo key clicks coroutine. And what we're going to want to do now is we're going to declare our control C handler to register our callback with the operating system. And then we're going to call this stop when function. Stop when control C. So I'm going to keep executing um, this coroutine, which echoes the key clicks in a loop. And then it should stop when I um, hit control C. Okay. Now, if you're, this was our um, key click operation before. And I mentioned that we're going to um, uh, remove this uh, special handling for control C here because we uh, no longer need it, supposedly. So we just nuke it. Okay. Now we have externalized our stop condition. So now we can use algorithms um, to specify our stop conditions. Okay. So let's look. Let's look at this. We've got uh, example three. Oops, example three. And example three. And here is our, um, here we're using the, the range transform. We can see our um, control C handler here with uh, um, create simple, creating our sender. And here is our, um, our control C handler. And if we go up to the, um, to the operation state, we can see that we are um, no longer, we no longer have that special code for handling control C. And so here is our, our main function with the stop when algorithm should be able to um, execute this. Now, uh, let's see here. And so now I can type a bunch of stuff. I can hit Control C. Well, this is this is interesting. I, it, it didn't actually um, send the interrupt, but this is actually a, um, a, a symptom of the fact that we are uh, hacking, hacking that, that keyboard um, registration callback API. Um, uh, the, that that platform specific get ch function, um, you know, once you've called it, there's no way to interrupt it. Um, so it's just going to block until the next character is read, and uh, we end up printing it. Um, that's something that I'm not going to be able to fix. Uh, but like a real system API call um, for registering keyboard callbacks uh, wouldn't have that problem. Um, and then I should be able to control C again. Oops. That didn't work. That didn't work. So we forgot something. Let's go back. What did we forget? Why doesn't this work? So although stop when sends a stop request, the key click operation isn't actually listening for one. Well, that's a problem. It should register a stop callback. So let's change our pending completion to have a cancellation function. We write a function, cancel key click, which dequeues the pending completion and cancels it. Now we change our key click operation. It is now going to have a stop callback. And that stop callback is going to um, call this cancel key click function that we just wrote when a cancellation, when a stop request has come in. 
Okay. We change our stop function to construct that callback. We use in place to construct it in place using the optional. And then we also have to implement this cancel function uh, where we call set done. This stop token that I pull out of the receiver, that is in cahoots with the um, uh, stop source that is uh, declared by the stop when algorithm. Okay. Now I wanna point out here that there's um, a subtle race condition. Uh, I have to do two operations here. Um, I would like to do them atomically. I am not doing them atomically. So there is a small window in which a cancellation signal could actually get lost. Um, correctly implementing uh, cancellation is probably the hardest part of um, producing uh, these asynchronous APIs. Uh, I feel like we're not doing enough right now to make it easy. Um, I, I know how to solve this problem. Um, you, would, um, uh, you would basically queue all of your accesses to the pending completion global and the construction of the stop callback to a dedicated thread. And then you would use a bool to record the fact that if a, a, you know, a, a stop request comes in, um, when there isn't a pending um, uh, completion, then you have to um, remember that fact so that when a pending completion comes in, you can cancel it. Um, I don't have time uh, to go into all of that here, though, so I apologize. For me. So um, now this should work. And I can type a bunch of characters. I can control C. Oops, I forgot to, um, apologies. This is still uh, example three, which is broken. Example four. Which now uh, is interruptible. And it's the algorithm that's sending that stop request. Now all that remains is a boatload of nasty platform-specific hackery. Um, all that demo, co demo code can be found here. Um, Kirk Shoup uh, implemented it, and it's beautiful. Um, and I, I think I still have a little bit of time to actually uh, demo uh, Kirk's code that he wrote. So now I can get keyboard clicky sounds uh, even in uh, other applications. Happy me, happy wife. All right. Uh, now I can control C and stop this and exit cleanly. Okay. Now I think I'm just about out of time. Um, so um, you guys can all look at the slides later for uh, where we're planning on taking this work. My apologies, um, hard to cover all of this material in just one hour, um, but you can find the additional resources here. Um, here's the paper that proposes all of this stuff. Here's libunifex that implements it. And here's where you can find all of the demo code, including Kirk's lovely, um, Model M simulator. Okay, uh, I see I'm out of time. Uh, I didn't have time for questions, but you can find me uh, in Gather Town right after this uh, in um, uh, what track E. All right. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, this was a ton of fun for me. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Yep. Thank you very much.